Coker is a healthcare business podcast from the Coker Group that focuses on solutions to help healthcare organizations effectively navigate the changing healthcare industry landscape. Welcome to Coffee with Coker. And uh, on today's episode, we have a guest that's been on with us before, uh, Brant Jewell. Welcome back to the podcast, Brant. Thanks, Mark. Good to see you. Yeah, and, and we're going to dive right in um, talking today about something that we we absolutely um, we do a lot of work around this, but we've been getting more and more questions from clients and, and needs from clients. But specifically, we're, we're going to be talking about uh, building a high performing position enterprise. Um, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, so we'll jump in here with Brand. Before I do that, uh, as always, I like to just uh, mention a couple housekeeping items. We want to remind everyone that uh, you can listen to not only this episode, but all of the Coffee with Coker podcast episodes um, via our website. You can find those at coffeewithcoker.com, as well as all of the thought leadership and uh, research documents that uh, Coker puts out. You can find all of that at cokergroup.com. Uh, feel free to, to download any of those documents, to follow us, um, and listen to any of the other podcast episodes in the past. Um, but the best way to do that is just to either follow us or subscribe any of the, the normal podcast platforms, um, as well as on social media. You can find links and references to all of our uh, content that we put out. So we appreciate you guys tuning in and following us and keeping up to speed with us as we uh, like to um, provide thought leadership going out uh, each week, uh, sometimes multiple times a week. Um, So with that, I'd like to jump right into today's conversation. Again, we're talking about uh, building uh, high-performing physician enterprise. And so what does that mean? We're going to unpack that a little bit. We want to um, also mention that this conversation goes hand-in-hand hand with a couple of documents that have been released relatively recently um, that Brant and some of his team members have put together. And um, so we have a uh, a white paper that was put out on this topic that provides a lot of detail. Today, we'll probably be covering this and and relatively uh, from a relatively high looking viewpoint, um, just because there is so much in this topic to unpack. But there's also a really good case study that Brandt and, and another one of his teammates, John Rosen, put together um, with some examples and illustrations based on uh, recent client work that we've done. And I think the case study, quite frankly, is something that that helps put a lot of these principles and techniques and, and tactics that we're, we're going to be talking about um, into a really helpful illustration um, for how some of this stuff can really work and, and help organizations. And so, and this applies to a, a health system that has a physician enterprise of employed uh, clinicians. Um, it can also apply very much to independent groups that are out there. So um, I think this is going to be relevant for uh, a really broad range of our audience. So we hope you guys enjoy um, but Brant, I, I guess with that, let's let's dive in and, and we'll, we'll be referring back to the uh, white paper a, a good bit here. And so um, there's a lot more detail there, but maybe just tee us up on kind of the, the key overarching focus of building high, high performing physician enterprise. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, so I think this is a dynamic topic because there is no single way to do this, right? And every physician enterprise we work with is unique, uh, whether that's because of the multi-specialty mix, the location, their employment relationship with the health system or private equity group, or you name it. Um, there, there are so many different things to consider. And so what we tried to do here with the, both the white paper and the case study is give an example of all the areas that we like to cover and address. And than how we have done so with a, a particular client where we had some really strong success. And it doesn't mean that that success is easily replicable or that you can go about it the exact same way in another environment. But um, there may be kind of nuggets of wisdom in, within those uh, areas that certain leaders can take back to their practices and their organizations to get the most out of their people, their infrastructure, and, and just improve their performance. I think. Have a lot of health systems and and private groups have been through a couple of generations here of employment and strategy and what does it mean you know to to get paid on performance and 
um, all these different models that we're experiencing with private equity and the different you know, single specialty entities that we see coming out. There's just a lot of there, there's a lot of confusion about where to focus, and so as we lay out these seven components, um, any one of them may be the burning platform for your organization or for the group that you're working with. And you may put all your efforts into just engaging the workforce. And that may lead to a better performance with things like operations and financial performance and um, you know, governance and, and leadership. But it may be that you need to focus on all of them. And, and then you have a different set of, of circumstances and you're going to need a different project work plan to get that done. And what I think is particularly helpful about uh, the case study versus just kind of the textbook knowledge and the white paper where we walk through the seven areas is in that particular case, we did an assessment for for revenue cycle. One particular area is what we were supposed to be looking at. Thought we weren't collecting as much as we should based on our performance. We get in there and find there's a number of that that is true. And then there are a number of other issues and areas that also need to be addressed. And in speaking with this health system, which is a, a community hospital system employed about uh, 40 providers at the time, and uh, about 30 of those were physicians, multi-specialty. And they were struggling across really all areas of leadership. And as we talked about some of the things we saw, they said, well, we don't really have the experience or leadership uh, knowledge and, and talent here to manage this or to figure out what to do with all of this information. And quite frankly, we're not sure we ever will. Right, we 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 probably can't pay what it's going to cost for someone for that with that senior level of experience to come here and and be a full time employee. And so, what we ended up doing is spending about a year there in an interim role that doesn't that doesn't exist anymore. So they created a role for a, a year that we filled and then worked with their team, kind of a teach us to fish approach. And the idea, uh, the analogy I use is. A lot of people can drive boats, but not everybody can build the ship. And so we helped them build the ship. And now they're driving the boat very successfully um, and have had great results. We still participate in monthly calls and review of reports and things that we put in place to give them guidance and advisory, but nothing like the full-time interim role that we were we were working under. And for them, that was absolutely the right approach. And so when we get things right and consult them, we like to celebrate that we got it right and that we got great results for our client. And and not only did we diagnose it correctly, but we we helped uh, actually get the results that the that the client was looking for. Um, and so it's, it's a success story. That same approach may not work for a, a client with somewhat similar circumstances. Everyone's got a little bit different dynamic. And a lot of times it's the soft stuff that uh, we find are the biggest barriers um, could be uh, the physician leadership, the lack of physician leadership could be turnover in the executive or administrative leadership area. Um, it might just be flat out budget and infrastructure. Our systems don't do it the way we need it to. We can't get good reporting and we can't afford better. Yeah. Um, so there, there are a number of different areas to to focus on. And part of what we want people listening and, and reading these these documents to be able to do is start to self-diagnose and and figure some of that out on your own. And if, if you want assistance diagnosing, we can obviously do that. But we're finding more and more clients don't want us to come and build all seven components of a high performing physician enterprise for them. It's a lot to a lot to even talk about, much less to actually do. And the work plans can get uh, rather complex uh, when we're talking about implementing solutions here. But if we can pinpoint you know, with the one, one, two, or three areas that are your biggest burning platforms, then then we can we can talk about the best way to get the results. And sometimes that might be in management, like this case study example. And other times it might be a mix of, of resources that we apply. Some with technical expertise. Sometimes it's you know inclusive of coding audits and compliance plans to go along with the uh, you know financial performance improvement that may result from increase in productivity and patient access, or it may be more revenue cycle focused. And so figuring all of that out on the front end so that we know we're marching down the same path together is really what this process is designed to do. Yeah. Well, th th that's a lot to unpack there, but, but I like the way you put it. And I guess we should probably just, just for the, the sake of, of those listening, if you haven't reviewed the white paper yet, um, it goes into detail on these um, seven components of enterprise excellence that Brant alluded to. And we're not going to go into 
those in detail today. Frankly, again, they, those are covered very in a very detailed way. Each one uh, in the white paper. Briefly, I'll just I'll just go through the list of what they are. We have operational excellence, uh, data driven accountability system, intentional collaboration, financial optimization, engaged workforce, position governance and leadership, and high performing high performance culture. And um, and I think those are all. Of those are um, to your point, Brant. Probably things that when we go in and work with an organization, it's not that we have to cover every single one of the, uh, one of those. Some are going to be more of a priority than others as far as the need there. But I think it really goes to your point on looking to achieve performance improvement or change management initiatives, uh, whatever it may be, addressing one or multiple or all even of the seven components. The interim approach is one of those things that we found that is. Um, like I like the way you put it, building the ship and you build the ship for them to drive and take from there. Um, that's something that's a big hurdle to get over. I think that's a good analogy. Talk for a minute about the case study itself. It gives a little bit of a, of a setting the stage or the setting for what you guys engage with there. I know you mentioned it was a community hospital, but you know, kind of set that stage a little bit for us. Yeah. So very common story, I think, as you look across health system employed provider enterprises, where over the years, for a variety of reasons, some of which were health system strategy and uh, aggressive growth, you know, about 10 years ago, if any any practices that a health system could buy to increase their market share in their network were attractive in many cases. And now we've been in an environment where employment is so attractive, but Health systems aren't as willing to just bring that on to their income statement as they maybe once were. And you're seeing a lot more activity in a similar manner on the private equity side uh, to just gobble up you know, practices of a certain specialty or, or across multiple states and, and a region. And in this case, what they had was a, a conglomeration of a bunch of private practices, right? So they had they had acquired some good and some not as good groups and from their local market over time, and they had let them just kind of keep going. And sometimes that's even a sell point to these practices when when uh, hospital executives are talking about acquiring them. Like, look, we're not going to mess up or upset your apple cart. Just come join us. We'll let you keep going as you want. And then a few years later, they realize, you know what, we really do need everyone on the same system. Uh, or you know what, we have too many docs and practices to still have this many staff in each location and not start to pool some of our resources around certain functions. Um, and it just starts to feel and clunky. Everyone's got different policies, different definitions of what it, what things mean, and that becomes unwieldy to manage. Even for the most seasoned practice executives, um, you know they're they're going to have trouble managing something like that. But it's even worse if what you've done is bring all that together and and really never hire a true leader for the enterprise, but just kind of let the practice managers from each of those practices be the leadership of your medical group or your physician enterprise. And that's what had happened here is they had. They had never provided training, uh, education, or anything for these practice managers who had worked in a private practice environment, and now they're working in a an employed health system model, and yet they're still they still feel most beholden to their practice, their group, the one that they came in with, and so there was certainly a cultural dynamic shift. Um, and and this group, you know, I think part of the reason we had such great success is because their hearts and minds were in the right place. No one. No one put up a barrier of protectionism, which is sometimes uh, uh, can be a stop loss for this type of change where practices say, look, I'm just not doing it. You can you can redesign my scheduling template all day, but I'm going to tell my MA, my team, my nurse to do it the way I want, and we're going to work around you. Um, and then it becomes what kind of backbone and spine do we as an organization have to manage to a higher place? So it definitely requires, uh, I think it's a, from what I'm hearing and what I've seen in my own experience is a, um, a reasonable approach going in, meaning you don't have to just turn their entire worlds over right away after a deal's done. Um, there's valid, there, I think oftentimes valid points to let them stay kind of continuing to do things the way they have. However, there is going to need to be at some point some degree of integration, just for, from a scalability standpoint and efficiency standpoint. And frankly, I think most people, once they're in these deals for a period of time, they actually welcome it. But again, to your point, 
being also being willing to compromise a little bit on those things. So you're not kind of just putting your head in the sand and saying, no, I'm, I, I, I don't want to change. Yeah. But reasonable change. Right. And I think in this case, one of the biggest uh, strongholds we had coming out of the gate for getting these results was that they really turned the keys over. And so a lot of places we want to be more targeted. Let's just focus on this one area. And when we do that in a vacuum, we might have great success around cultural development or reporting or revenue cycle performance, but that may not bleed over across the organization. I can think of another example where we worked with a larger health system, about 100 employed physicians, and we stayed in our rev cycle lane the entire time. And by the time we got to the end of it, We were meeting with the practices and there was a disconnect. Part of the whole problem was the disconnect between these practices spread out across the community and the centralized billing function. And when we talk about RevCycle, we're including front office staff. And when you realize how variable each of the front offices actually works and their work rooms, how they define a no-show, a cancellation, all these types of things started to be highlighted. And we weren't really there to fix that. And so we addressed some of it as we go, but they got they got the results they were looking for just in revenue cycle. I think they'll end up having another round of some of those uh, other areas that they have to uh, have to address eventually. And they just weren't ready for a number of reasons. And we called it to the organization's attention and they, they weren't ready to go to battle over some of those things with the docs at that time. And I respect that. I think they you know, mm-hmm. know their, their group best, but at some point, if you want this panacea we're describing of the high performing culture and and excellence and all these things, you, you can't just do one, one at a time. Having said that, I do think it's good to start with objective areas first. And so revenue cycles, an example I always use where we can all agree at the end of the day, we want to collect the, the most revenue we can for the services we're providing. And so let's do Let's all do a great job of this. Positions agree, the staff agree, leadership agrees. This is something that we should do better with. And so it's a rallying point for change management. And we'll often start with that. And then you can work towards things like scheduling and touching provider schedules, something very personal. Staffing, how do we we use our people most efficiently? Is everyone doing... Uh, is everyone doing the best they can with the roles and responsibilities we've assigned? Um, and have we? how clear have we been about those roles and responsibilities? And what kind of system of accountability do we have to manage that? Uh, those are very personal areas. You're talking about people's jobs. You're talking about uh, people's schedules that maybe they've done this like this for a long time and don't want to change. But um, you know, if you're going to have a, a high-performing enterprise, then you have to treat it as an enterprise. And that's what the case study client allowed us to do. They bought into that concept and they said, here are the keys to the to the car. You show us how to build this enterprise as opposed to fixing little problems throughout our, our group. And I think that's why they had such comprehensive results because the, the culture and the data and reporting and the lean process mapping fed every single one of those areas of performance as opposed to just doing all that work for revenue or just yeah. for patient access. Yeah, that's that's uh, to their credit to to the the client in this case study uh, credit. You know, it's not always the case as far as being able to look at it uh, or being willing to truly approach it from an enterprise perspective. And so, in this case, I know, and and you you mentioned this earlier, we started with this role of um, basically a a temporary role interim um, that didn't need to be permanent, but it was necessary to kind of get this platform built um, and to get the engine developed so it could run more efficiently um, after this role was this role ended. Um, and and you mentioned starting in um, in in the the revenue cycle assessment process, and I completely agree. I mean, that's one of those sort of the perhaps one of the most fundamental elements to if you don't have that work in, then you're going to have a lot of other problems, I guess is my point. And um, it's also one that is probably the most challenging uh, for many organizations at times, particularly when you're talking about health systems trying to uh, become or maintain efficiency when it comes to physician billing. Um, and so maybe talk about that when we think about some of the other tactics that you guys took over this roughly year long period of this role. Um, starting with the financial, it sounds like, what did you guys build on? after that? Yeah. So I think uh, 
we, everyone likes to get the financial returns first because then it justifies investing in some of the other areas of performance. Sure. And the ironic part is that the more you invest in some of those other areas, the stronger the financial performance becomes. And so um, I think there's there's low hanging fruit when we think about financial performance. And a lot of that is related to revenue cycle, right? Are we, you know, what are we doing with patient collections? What are we doing with net collections and our fee schedules, right? All these different things, you know, we're getting clean claims out the door in the first place, right? And so those are easy areas to to focus on because they're objective. And again, I think it's a, a, a great place to start and, and do support that. We've learned that over the years that it's almost easier to go in that way and start working with groups than it is to start with the patient access and and, and throughput, for example. Um, but as we think about operational excellence, you know, it, it sound a lot of this can sound fancy, data driven accountability systems and intentional collaboration, and um, and it's really not. It's not rocket science. And and what we what we like to do is very practical, and it should be practical and clear to all those involved, whether that's physicians. Um, Provide other providers, um, you know, the staff, leadership, and so just clarifying roles and responsibilities is a big one. And then in clarifying roles and responsibilities, let's clarify policy and procedures. How are we scheduling these types of patients? How are we handling annual wellness visits? What is our process or our definition around a clinical FTE? Um, and so getting some of the getting some things documented and agreed upon up front. And then managing to it. A lot of this is a system of accountability where without data and reporting, it makes it hard for a practice manager that manages upstream to you know, executive leadership and maybe at the hospital or the health system, or maybe uh, there's another layer in between in some of these large organizations, directors and administrators. And then also downstream, you got supervisors, leads, and then all the staff. And it's hard for any one of those levels to really appreciate what we're what they're doing individually or what we are doing as an organization without some consistent data and reporting where we give ownership to those uh, in the seats where they can impact it. And so uh, we do a lot of work with not just having a dashboard that the executive leadership looks at once a month and says, oh, how did we do? We got to do better next month. But if I'm in the call center, centralized call center, what are the three things that I should be focused on. And let's and we incorporate those into job competencies and and put them in as part of their their scope of work. And then it gives their manager something to talk about during the annual review process. And it gives a way for uh, some kind of comparison and accountability when you've got one person in the call center making 200, taking 200 calls a day and another doing 50, then let's share some best practices and figure out why we're not able to, to perform at the same level. And it's not necessarily a pursuit of, uh, you know, I think accountability can get a bad connotation of we're going to hunt down people who aren't doing a good job. And at the end of the day, a lot of times people don't feel like they've been given the skill set, the information, the training, et cetera, to do a good job. And we see that a lot with EHR utilization and physicians uh, will be very transparent about that in my experience where they'll say, look, I just don't know. I don't know how to use the templates very well. I don't type well. I can't use it in the room. And so those are big deals for getting another patient or two through every day. And so, um, you know, a lot of what we do is based on having done it before. It's not so complicated that we can't teach others to do it. And sometimes it's just a resource issue. We, we all have bandwidth. For any of you out there who are practice managers, you know, tell me when you have the free time to focus on um, improving these seven different areas and amongst your other uh, roles and responsibilities. Same will go for physicians or anyone you're paying by the hour to answer phones, process patients, et cetera. Um, everyone's busy. And even when they're not efficient, they're busy. And that's a hard, that's a hard lesson to learn when we go in. And so, um, you know, a lot of it is just having done it before, putting together the right plan, and then being organized and relentless in the pursuit of it. And and when organizations finally say, okay, we are ready to be relentless in pursuing improvements in these areas, and we think these are our top three areas and these are our bottom three, then that's when you see a lot of the buy-in and and willingness to change. Uh, and it starts with the fundamentals, just like a lot of sports would. And once you get the fundamentals in place, you can build upon that. So when we talk about operational excellence, um, it sounds like you know people hitting home runs everywhere all day long. And that's not necessarily the case. It's really the basic blocking and tackling. Do we have our X's and O's in the right place with the right game plan to execute? And then some days we'll do better than others, and that's okay. And yet we will know how we're doing every day, and the people doing it will know how they do every day. There's so much, 
there's so much unknown with a lot of practices and and enterprises where even physicians don't know, am I performing well or not? Is this my target? Do I have a clear target? Um, I'm pretty happy with what I'm getting paid, but how much better could it be if I were to do things differently? Um, and so I, I think that's where there's really a lot to be gained from the process and not just the results. You know, we don't come in and just hand someone a widget that says, here, if you do, if you do this, then you'll you'll double your revenues or you'll you'll collect X percent more. But yeah. the process of learning that is is really where a lot of the value comes. Uh, that's a really good and and, and important point to emphasize. Um, there is no magic solution or silver bullet uh, idea that's going to address this, fix this, et cetera. Um, and, and one of the things we're talking about here is um, the, the emphasis on sustainable high performing infrastructure and and I think there are a lot of organizations out there that can build a really good plan um, and possibly even a roadmap towards implementation but take, taking a step back and asking hey do we have the fundamental framework here the platform that if we stay on this path will essentially ensure or certainly help maximize the potential for a year from now, for three years from now, for five, et cetera, years from now, is it still going to be sustainable? Is this something that is going to be working well over a period of time? And I think that's where some of the things that you all um, covered in this example, again, the importance of having that interim role there to build that framework in such a way that it is sustainable. Um, you, you mentioned or uh, talked a little bit about the monitoring and accountability piece. Well, needless to say, that goes directly hand in hand with the vision and leadership piece when we're talking about sustainable, high performing infrastructure, because um, like you said, in order for the accountability piece to work, you have to have clearly defined objectives and that vision that is communicated and effectively articulated to those people. So the accountability and the monitoring piece makes sense. It's, so it's not a negative thing. It is a a positive thing that works for the organization and, and ultimately probably improves the the, the uh, ability for the staff, the team members to uh, achieve whatever goals they have or, or objectives that have been given for them. Yeah, it, it's certainly the way that we approach it is more of a carrot system than a stick system, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times your high performers are more frustrated than your low performers that they're doing above and beyond and no one knows, maybe even their own physician doesn't know what, how much they're doing and what they're taking on. Um, the confusion between front office staff, clinical staff, and then a central billing office, or, or we'll call it back office, um, and the gaps in communication about who's supposed to do what and, and where do we communicate and document that. Uh, there's just, it's ripe for confusion. I think what overwhelms a lot of leaders is, well, the problem in this clinic is different than the problem in that clinic. And then maybe even the problem within this clinic between the, each of these teams is different. And so when you can't go in and solution for uh, the same problem, I think it becomes overwhelming and too much to bite, bite off. And, and what we see a lot of times is kind of paralysis where instead of trying to, instead of trying to fix the fundamentals and being comprehensive with the approach, we, try to fix one thing. Let's focus on patient balance collections, or let's focus on just our, uh, just our phone stats. Right. And so those, all, those things all help, but we see organizations get obsessed with a number, a metric, one area of performance. And at the end of the day, one of these things does not make or break a high performing enterprise. Uh, it's all of them working together in concert. That is the, that it's what really is impressive to see uh, at the at the highest levels. And so, you know, it doesn't always have to be that interim approach, like we said. And I think one of the things we've had success with recently is interims, interim resources when there is not an open role. So you've got an executive director or an administrator or a COO of a medical group, and we provide a peer type person to just be the right arm and focus on the special projects, the performance improvement, these other areas, and teach and help uh, whoever's in that role throughout the process. And so it's not a replacement of a resource because if you're managing the day-to-day, -day, it's always hard to focus on the advancing of the ball as well, right? There's too many fires to put out, too many doctors calling with issues, too many staff uh, telling you about problems, calling out sick, those types of things. And so, um, you know, we, we've seen a lot of a lot of success with additional resource 
even for a you know four to six month time frame where it's kind of a blitz on getting some of these components set up and there was no need, there was no turnover that created an impetus for an interim. Um, and sometimes it's not just one person. Sometimes it's a team of people who have different levels of subject matter expertise where we've seen, you know, some, you know, EHR optimization with someone who's very technical talking through that with physicians and staff and others and creating super users within these organizations or doing the same sort of thing in the billing office. You know, here are the policy and procedures. Now here's how you're going to manage it moving forward and here are the metrics we're going to hit. You know, developing the right scheduling criteria, um, things like that that can, again, aren't that hard if you have the bandwidth and the experience to say, we know this works, this will help you, let's implement it, and we'll compile it at first if we need to do it. There's so many different approaches to getting adoption. Um, but I, I really, I think organizations now, especially coming out of COVID, are less and less willing to settle for mediocrity. And and if you're going to employ physicians, there, there are too many ways to do it well for you to continue to muddle through. And I think uh, when we talk about the bottom line impact and whether you're a health system who views that as an investment or a loss uh, on the on your income statement for, for employing for providers or uh, private equity or private practice where you know your net income is your salary at the end of the day um, or your ROI, then either way, in any of those scenarios, we're seeing less and less willingness for poor financial performance and you get the financial performance, in my opinion, when you have the right infrastructure to support the financial performance. And, and whether you focus directly on collections and billing and, and finance, financial management, expense management, um, or if you focus on comprehensive operations that lead to financial performance improvement, there are a number of ways to get after it. Everyone's in a different scenario. But I think hopefully with some of these tools, you know, you can start to diagnose to where you're weak and strong. And if you have questions as you go about uh, what, what in particular might help you, um, you know, please give us a call. We'd, we'd love to talk about these things and hear about the different scenarios. And we're doing a lot of work around the country with groups that are, that are really focused and intentional with how they're improving right now. And some of the, some of the best things we can do right now are just connect similar clients to other clients and say, Hey, talk to them about this. Um, very similar scenario. They're having the same issue and you've been successful with this approach and maybe they could learn something from that. Yeah. I, I think that, that, that sums it up well. I mean, you, I think we've reached a point in this progression of, of in, in terms of this model of physician enterprise development and operations uh, that accepting mediocrity just is no longer an option. I mean, and, and, and I think it's safe to say, uh, nobody's surprised to hear that. And it's safe to say that no one, no organization goes out there wanting to be, have mediocre performance. But the, the competitive nature that we've been seeing here in, in the current marketplace, again, like you said, whether it's a health system employing groups, or a private equity buying up groups, or just independent groups that need to remain competitive and viable within the marketplace, um, with all those other dynamics happening around them, these are going to be essential things in order to not maintain mediocrity, but to truly kind of achieve that high performing um, levels, if you will. And, and I think there's, there's a lot here, like you said, it's not just, rel rarely is it one thing. Um, it, it, there's stuff that goes hand in hand. The organizational and operational stuff absolutely impacts the financial performance and vice versa as well, as we know. I think you guys covered it really well in this example where it illustrates how those things go hand in hand, meaning the the relevance or the importance of focusing on provider productivity. Um, when we focus on uh, expense management and revenue maximization in the rev cycle system. Um, and it, but also talking about uh, the the correlation with between margin and patient satisfaction and and then other services that are involved and then implementing um, so, you know some sort of uh, lean resource management program, things like that that frankly, just cannot be in the regular day job responsibilities of most of the executives running these groups. Um, sure, they're relevant, and we would love for them to be able to address all these, but the reality is some of those things are just going to have to have someone dedicated, again, even if it's for an interim period, dedicated to that's their day job, focusing on those things, fixing them, or maybe not even fixing them, maybe building a model, an engine, whatever, to help them. Uh, maintain sustainability and continue to allow improvements 
that may be the answer. Um, and it's not, it's not easy. <laughs> I don't think it's ever easy, but there's a level of simplicity here that I think is, is appealing and intriguing. Yeah. I think hardwiring this into your culture is the, is the hard part and everyone's got a different culture and a different way of going about that. But ultimately that's where you're going to see the sustainable results. And, and when you focus on a project for just increasing our patient collections or cleaning up our fee schedules or improving our net collections, uh, you can get some results on that. And then if you stop managing, managing it or measuring it, then you might backslide. Um, same can go with scheduling or, or, you know, how you manage chronic no-show patients, things like that. And so, uh, you can get some good results in a number of different ways, but when you truly develop a culture where there's transparency from executive leadership to frontline staff and providers about what we're trying to accomplish and what we're trying to build, um, you know, where staff and physicians help manage the improvement in a sense where, you know, hey, we all agreed at the most recent meeting that we were going to do this. And I see you not doing what we said we were going to do. That's taking it out of the hands of of a practice manager or executive leadership to police that now because the group is demanding a higher level of performance from themselves. And that's when it's a really powerful tool when it doesn't have to be managed by a person or, or a group of leaders and, and, and everyone starts to see the, the single vision and the, and the, the destination. And, and that can be pretty powerful. Yeah. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. And, and I think that's, that brings it full circle to a certain extent, at least um, from a, from our discussions perspective. Um, I, I, I really do want to encourage everyone listening to this. If you haven't already though, review the, uh, building a high performance physician enterprise white paper, um, which will make sure the links to uh, the, these documents are available um, in the notes of this podcast episode, but also probably the, uh, the quicker read and extremely helpful information is outlined in the case study itself. And some of the things, some of the more specific things that we just, for the sake of time, I mean, we could talk about this for hours, but for today's purposes, couldn't get into all these details, but there is a lot there. And I think, um, listen, this applies to a wide array of organization sizes, regions, uh, types of, in terms of services and scale. Uh, so this is all um, relevant, I believe. And, and I think people would get a lot of benefit from that. And, um, and we do, if, if, if folks would like to understand, maybe getting a little bit more specific, if they have a question about how this could apply with their organization or um, when one element of this applying to their organization, then um, I think this is something that would uh, we'd be happy to talk about and folks can reach out to us, reach out to Brant and make sure that uh, they get all of their questions answered. But with that, I think we'll close it there. And, and I really appreciate it, Brant. I appreciate you coming on and talking about this. And Um, As I always say, closing out these episodes, stay tuned because we're definitely going to be continuing to to talk about all the stuff we talked about here in in more detail and and continue to cover it as as more activity occurs. So thank you all for listening. Thanks, Brant. And we look forward to continuing the discussion in future episodes. Thanks, Mark. Always good to be with you. We hope you enjoyed that episode of Coffee with Coker, and we thank you for listening. We want to encourage all of our listeners to participate and contribute in the podcast. Uh, So if you have any questions uh, on any of the things we discussed in this episode, any of the topics that were presented, please feel free to ask us. Also, we welcome your feedback and suggestions. If you have any ideas uh, related to the, the material we discussed in this episode, or again, or in any episode, please let us know and we'll make sure to incorporate it. And if you have ideas for topics you'd like to hear more information about in future episodes, please send those suggestions to us. We'd love to hear them and we'd love to incorporate them into our future episodes. Uh, You can find us online and on social media. Start with our website and specifically the podcast is coffeewithcoker.com. You can also find that through the main Coker website at cokergroup.com. You can also find us on social media, Twitter at Coker Group. And then on LinkedIn, you can search for Coker Group and find our page and and the page for uh, some of our team members as well there. So you can find us and reach out to us a number of places. And then if you want to contact us directly, one of the best ways to do that, email feedback at cokergroup.com. That's feedback at cokergroup.com. And again, we'd love to get your feedback. 
And we'd love to encourage everyone to subscribe to the podcast so that you can be notified when future episodes are released. Uh, We look forward to uh, the next episode and we look forward to getting your suggestions and feedback on this episode. Thanks for listening. And we look forward to speaking with you again on future episodes.